Today is Tuesday, May 9th, 2023, and you're listening to the Ask a Christian podcast. I'm your host, Nate. Today, we spend the entire discussion, almost the entire discussion, talking about dream interpretations. Ooh. Can God slash does God send people dreams or visions, or is it bad pizza you ate the night before? Uh, I thought this was going to take like five or ten minutes. Turns out, like, I don't know an hour and something later. Um, we're still not done. I just have to shut it down because I got a headache. But um, anything you ever wanted to know about dreams, watch this. And uh, please share this link with people, maybe if they also care about dreams, because that's all we talk about today, almost. And check out the Ask a Christian book available on Amazon and the Ask a Christian store. Grab a t-shirt, support the cause. And if you'd like to donate and keep us going, uh, please do that. So, thank you, much appreciation, enjoy the discussion, and we will see you later. Happy Tuesday. Psychological meaning and revelation from God. We have to draw the line there, right? Yeah, I, I think it, think it can be both, though. Uh, for example, your, your subconscious could be aware of something that you really need to get done. And it, it could be on the back of your mind. If, if you push it back in your mind far enough... You will have dreams because I'm talking, I'm speaking personally here uh, of that thing, and you and you won't be able to reconcile it until you realize, ah, this is what it is. Yeah, but that's the psychological so like, aspect of it, not the revelatory part. Like when he's speaking, right. he sounds like he's speaking revelatory, which is the part that I'm pushing back against. Because like psychologically, you heard it here, we already have the study in the medicine to show that yes, they do have meaning, but when revelatory wise, no. I don't think that's happening today. The Bible's already finished. There's no more revelation that needs to happen. And if so, add it to it. Canonize. Well, all right. Well, let well me yeah. Have... Like, uh, well, I, I hang on. Uh, I, I mean, I think, yeah, you know, if I have a dream about an alligator and walking too close to a, a you know, lake, you can bet I'm going to think twice before I take a little step closer to a lake. It doesn't mean it's a, it's a vision, yeah, but... vision from God. Hold on. That means it's a vision from God. But then on the other hand, Chris, I would like your take. This is where you say we don't know how to read a book or something. But, you know, in the last days, old men will dream dreams and young men will see visions. What's your take on that? I mean, it was literally quoted in Acts that it was at that moment. For the record, no, I'm not I don't know. Maybe, yeah, I'm thinking maybe it's something today, but it, it could be it could be psychological. Uh, like, for example, like, let's take the example of an alligator, right, coming out of a lake and his alligators coming at you. Let's, let's say you consistently have this dream, right, of this alligator attacking you at the lake. Right. But uh, what it really is, is that you had a real bad date with a woman who happens to have an alligator leather purse <laughs> and it was by the lake. And it's something your subconscious is just warning you that you feel that this is just not right. So it could be a way your brain telling you by giving you a dream of an alligator attacking you that is really the woman with this type of purse. Like, you know, stuff like that. So, well, I mean, people do have those types. And also, I mean, I don't think as, as, I don't know, like when people are like, I don't know, can God, whatever. It, it would be the same thing. You're just, you know, semi-conscious. I mean, you're asleep. So, like, if, if someone believes, Chris, you may not. That, you know, the Holy Spirit will kind of like nudge you one way or another or convict you or, you know, something like that. When you're totally wide awake, um, you know, why couldn't it be a crossover combo of like of that, right? Like someone was talking about your subconscious of a dream. So not that God is, you know, shooting you like divine revelation from on high while you're while you're asleep. But, you know, maybe if like, I don't know, you're prompted or convicted of a certain thing in the day. Well, that carries over into your dream and you're like, oh, God just gave me a vision or God just gave me a dream. Um, well, if you want to, you know do something palatable where maybe Chris could accept it, be like, oh, technically, perhaps I was convicted of something in the day and it carried over into my subconscious. But if they're like, yeah, God, show me a dream. I'll be like, okay, sweet. But then if they get weird about it, I'm like, oh, okay, that may be too much. Is that something we can all, <laughs> well, why all agree is it, with? Well, why is it too deep to think? You're in the matrix, yeah. Yeah, you're in the matrix. Do you hear no me one now? heard you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so why is it too deep to say that the Holy the Holy Spirit's a helper and one way to help you consider? Uh, uh, there you go again. You're, yeah, you're God is there. or God is decreeing you not speak right now. Um, let us know when you have a better signal. But so no, CEO, I mean, I, what... I think I can posit his question. He's saying if the Holy Spirit is a helper, you know, which is true, 
um, why can he not help us through, you know, multiple different means? I think he does. I think that, you know, the Holy Spirit's job in John 16 is laid out as he convicts the world of sin. You know, like that's his job is to convict us of sin when we are in sin. And he does that through various different means. He moves our heart. He moves our emotions. Um, you know, he, he, he does all sorts of things. So it's not to say that God's Holy Spirit is not at work. Now, what I'm talking about is something completely different. I'm saying that God is not giving direct revelation a la the revelation of John seeing the apocalypse anymore. He's not, he's not going to, um, you know, Bill Johnson and showing him a vision of the blood moon and what this means for Bethel Redding. Well, I, I do believe God can show you some revelation of things. Like, uh, I, I, I have one, I had one dream maybe in my life where I felt like it was something that, um, I constantly ask God for interpretation for. Um, but for example, if you go to verses like Job 33, 15 through 18, right. Uh, it literally tells you that God will send you dreams in order to put fear upon you to correct you. Uh, so, uh, if Job is affirming that God can do such a thing, um, then, I mean, I, I guess it's still happening today. Hey, hey Chris, I, I just want to let you know that I I actually heard you. You, you. You're not saying that it can't happen today. You're just saying it's nothing worth writing down and making a prescription for all Christians in all times. Is that what you said, Chris? Repeat that again. He's basically like, I'm with you, Lou. Like, yeah, Lou, I'm with you. Like, for the record, like, being asleep has nothing to do with this. Like the overarching thing is basically, are there prophets? Are you getting like dreams that, that are so revelatory? We need to add scripture. We need to add canon because it's basically a prophecy from God. Or if it's not to that level, it could totally happen. But, uh, you know, in some sense, but not to the level of, you know, for all Christians to read because you'd have to add canon. Is that where you're going, Luke? Because I'm, I'm on the same page, I think. Well, yeah, because, I mean, I'm not sure why Kevin's giving a thumbs down for that, because, I mean, otherwise, I mean, I had a dream last night. Should we add it to scripture? And I'm going to hold you to it, Kevin. I mean, well, no. So the thumbs down was really uh, uh, it's kind of an agreement. So uh, the thumbs down is like, yeah, I agree. Uh, it's, it's, it's not anything that we should add to the Bible. If anything, I think if people have dreams today, they will bear witness to what's already written, not something to be added to the text. Yeah, all right. Can I comment? fine. So Can that's I what I heard, on? Chris. That what, what I wanted to say is that I heard you say that, Chris. I didn't hear you say nothing different from that. But go ahead, um, Felix. Okay, this is my position on this. I mean, I got I got in the conversation. I started hearing about dreams and stuff. So I, I'm not sure how it started, but if we're talking about our dream, is 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 God speaking to people through dreams still today? I would say no. Because, because, not that he can't, but that he doesn't. Because number one, we have the scriptures, which is all the revelation we, we, we need for living godly, you know, godly lives or whatever, right? So, and for to knowing, you know, God's will as far as he's revealed it. Now, if you, if you read Hebrews 1, verse 1 and 2, it speaks of how God used to speak to the, to the fathers of the Hebrews, right? It says, in, in past times, it was through the through the prophets. So if you go back, how how the prophets used to, God, how God used the prophets back then, well, it was visions, dreams, and, and stuff like that, because it was necessary at that time. That's how God communicated. In fact, when when Saul, King Saul, was seeking God's, you know, he was looking for God when the Philistines was coming upon him, or when he was in fear of fighting the Philistines. He said that he, he saw him and God did not answer him through dreams, neither, neither through dreams, neither through prophets, and neither through um, the Urim, which was basically the ways God communicated with his people back then were through those means. So if Hebrews 1 is saying that that's the way God spoke at a past time, it's letting me know that in this time he's not using those same means that he used to use back then. Not saying God changes. Because God doesn't change. I'm saying he changed the way he communicates. Uh, I think, uh, so you, that, can I ask a question? What, was the question, can God do it or does he do it? Does he do it? 
Oh, no. 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 Hey, yeah, I don't know Felix. Oh, I, I was just curious. Now, it's interesting that Hebrews 1 text, and I, and I think in context he's talking to how he spoke uh, to the fathers in times past, uh, talking about the general revelation. Uh, but he had the revelation salvifically speaking, I believe. In these last days, he's spoken to us through his son, which is a whole other conversation. But in Joel 2, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men uh, shall have visions. Your young men shall dream dreams. If it said that's going to happen in the last days, you went into the matrix. Yeah, we're not in the last days anymore. And I'm not talking to you over here. Oh, let me see. Can y'all hear me now? Can, can y'all hear me now? I'm sorry. Yeah, in Joel, in Joel 2, uh, the, one of the uh, manifestations of the last times, young men dreaming dreams and old men seeing visions. Are we not in the end? Are we to believe we're not at the end times anymore either? No, I asked Chris that. But Chris, I would, could you go ahead? You, you, you said something about context. Could you just go ahead and lay it out? Because this is going to be a recurring question. Can you just give us um, your thoughts on the old men, young men? Like, uh, you said like something about context that says it right there. I don't have Acts open right now, or I don't have that open right now. Can you you no, just want to lay out your Joel, thoughts on that? The book of Joel. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's what I mean. Can I give a suggestion real quick? The, the suggestion is maybe. maybe Chris could answer both questions. I think we're conflating two questions. One is, does God do this, and can God do this? And I think we keep crisscrossing those things. I, was just I want to hear the... I want, hang on. Yeah, we, we, I will moderate today. I failed yesterday. Chris, if you have a moment, could you thoroughly examine the old men, young men, dreams, visions thing? Yeah, I'm looking at the specific context. Can you give me 30 seconds? While he's looking Can at that. We have this moment of silence. While he's looking <laughs> at that. This is that. Yeah, Felix. No, I just want to say, in regards to Brandon's question, can I just ask, what? At what part, okay, okay, that prophecy is speaking of end times, but what part of the end times does that apply to? Because he also what, speaks what? of, you know what I'm saying? When I, think, when I think of the last days and he starts speaking, Joel starts speaking of, you know, the, the, the day, and I, I, I'm not going to quote it word for word how it says in English because I don't know it in English. But, you know, the last day is, is to me speaking of like Advent times, like the second Advent. So at what you point know what I'm sorry. I no, I, I was saying like, are these are these not Advent times, and are these not the last? Well, they are, we are in the last days, but this last days period is a long time, as we can see. Right. I, that, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, but he didn't say, well, this portion of the last days. He said the last days. Uh, he doesn't say, well, the beginning part of the last days and the end part. From my read, it's just saying the last days. So, Brandon, uh, we're trying. Bluetooth, uh, Brandon, are you in a Bluetooth speaker or something? Like, it's really, like, we hear you, but it's very, it sounds like you're on a CB radio, like a trucker radio. It's very staticky. Oh, you, you got to say 10 I'm driving good, buddy. through my car. Okay. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> can, you, can you fix that? You just got to like use minute, trucker please. lingo, though. If he uses, Is it okay Over. if he uses trucker lingo? Because I would love to hear Brandon be like, good, good, yeah. 10-4. Like, do it. Lingo is. Ten Just four, good buddy. Dude, Ten four. Answer, Chris, that's a minute. That's a minute and a half. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. I, I, What's your there twenty, you go. Chris? That's What's your twenty? Okay, so here's the here's the deal. So Brandon, we know that anything past Matthew twenty four, when Jesus is talking about the last days, the last days are between his crucifixion and resurrection and his second coming. Okay, that is that is biblically what the last days are. Now. Do we know that? We knew that we know that through the art and science of systematic theology, which I'm not going to go into right now. It's not you don't use the Bible as a series of proof texts. Well, we you take the Bible as a whole, and yeah, I mean, you know, if you guys want to have a four hour discussion about like what the last days are, we could totally do that. But I'm I mean, I can not do four minutes. Yeah, I'm not super prepared to do that right now. I mean, we can study and have a room on it anyway. Wait, wait, so um, could we get the the 10 second explanation? The 10 second like, explanation is that anything between the, like the apostles and every, all the writers of the new Testament considered themselves in the last days, because anything between 
um, you know, the, the resurrection of Jesus and Pentecost, you know, well, really Pentecost is the breaking point, right? Is the church age. Anything between Pentecost and the second coming was considered the last days and that Jesus could come at any minute and that there was a sense of urgency amongst the apostles and the New Testament writers that they were in the quote last days and we are still in that same milieu, if you will. Okay. So, and again, we can, we can talk all through that theology at some point, but like that goes beyond our scope. But the, the idea of the last days is simply that, and it doesn't really necessarily mean like all of these dispensations that are broken up. I would say at the end of the apostolic age, sign gifts that were assigned to the apostles to attest to the uh, legitimacy of the New Testament revelation um, those died with the apostles because they could do those at will. Now, that doesn't mean that God doesn't do miraculous things or he doesn't do signs and wonders. He does. He heals more today than ever before, etc. What it means is that there are no more modern day apostles and prophets that are adding to the text of scripture and then attesting to that through signs and wonders. That is essentially my position. Now, dreams and visions would fall under that rubric as signs and wonders that would be used to either give direct revelation or to attest to a person who is an apostolic father who is adding to the text of scripture or who has the ability to do so. Because the canon is closed and there are no more apostles and prophets along the lines of Agabus and Peter and Paul and John, then we do not have revelation directly because we've already been given that in the scripture and the scripture according to second timothy 3 16 and 17 is fully sufficient so that's the argument so chris is there a difference between when we're talking about uh dreams that like it seems personal to you and helpful to you versus talking about dreams that are revelatory? Do you make a, dif a differentiation with that? Because if the Holy Spirit's a helper and we think it can help influence our thoughts, why would that not carry over into dreams? He can. So I'm not saying that he can't. What I said earlier is that the Holy Spirit uses all sorts of means. And so psychologically, the Holy Spirit can be bringing something back to mind that gets dredged up in our subconscious you know, that we know is subconscious now through, you know, we just have terms for it, but they would have known this as well. It's not to say that we cannot, you know, be convicted of sin and all sorts of other things through all sorts of means. Like we can have, you know, our brain sorts things out and it's like, man, I treated Bubby really badly yesterday because I had a dream about Bubby. And then I wake up and I think about it. And then I'm like, I really need to go to Bubby and make things right. Do you, you, do you see the difference between that and I had a supernatural dream that Bubby is in trouble and I have to go find him right now? That's a that's a huge difference, right? So you don't so you don't think dreams can be forewarnings at all? Brandon, I feel so bad. You keep trying to talk and you just get are so in the matrix. It's like really really bad. I know it, it's the drive. Can, can you hear me a little better now? A little bit better, but you keep getting cut off, and I don't know why. Yeah, it's, it's I'm on the drive. The work is real spotty. But I guess my, my only looking at it from just a different perspective, if it's just like a psychological thing coming from your subconscious, arguably, I mean, that could happen to a Muslim. There is no need to even uh, attribute that to the Holy Spirit because I think just the you know consciousness of man uh, being made in his image, uh, I mean, subconsciously can make you think, you know, like, oh man, I should have treated this person better. So to me, that'd be something like an atheist could, could potentially have as far as, you know, dreams of visions. But I guess the statement of Joel and Peter's application, I guess I would wonder about that rubric because we see the pouring out of the spirit on all flesh. And again, the text, we don't see it saying, well, this is for apostolic, uh, how can you say apostolic uh, proof of their ministry, even though I believe they did have signs and wonders for their ministry, but it kind of attributes this output on all flesh, your sons and daughters shall prophesy. And, and I guess looking at that, are we bringing something to the text that is not explicitly saying 
And I, and I say that just kind of politely looking at it from a different vantage point because, and I understand the cessationist argument that, well, we observe, but I'm like, well, the Catholic Church says they observe things, but I guess, does the scripture say? Yeah, and that's and that's a good point. I mean, like, we could go through and exegete the text. I mean, the text that we're talking about right now, and the reason that it's it's significant is that, you know, in Acts 2.16, it says, but this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel, and it shall be... And it shall be in the last days, God says that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind. That's the Greek word for flesh, you're correct, sarks. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male slaves and female slaves, I will in those days pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will put wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. And the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And it will be at that that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So, I mean, this is talking about a huge swath of... Uh, what we call, uh, you know, the redemptive story. So we're going all the way from the day of Pentecost to the great and terrible day of the Lord, right? And so I agree. this is, right? So, I mean, so, that sounds like what we're in. So why are you saying it's not? Well, because, again, like, we're talking... Because that sounds very revelation-y. Like, right. And that's exactly right. Is like, you know, he's they're talking about how you know, you're, your sons and daughters are going to prophesy, and at this moment they are, because we see, like, the daughters that prophesy later on in Acts. We see the prophet Agabus, all of these things. And then all of these things, when the apostles had finished the New Testament, suddenly stopped. And then thousands of years happen, and then suddenly, the, you know, and so this is where, so, like, with the Zusa Street and stuff, they use this to say, hey, look, we're in these other last days that are talked about in this text. And so this is the re-pouring out at the end of the age where all of these signs and wonders are going to occur. So that's, that is one position on the text that they took from, you know, uh, well, they, they, I'll, Seymour. Zeus have got a lot of stuff wrong. Uh, and I just will say, I don't... Boy, we can agree on Zeus that. <laughs> yeah, they got a lot of stuff. I don't. I mean, the Trinity for one, but I mean, uh, yeah. So, <laughs> but no, it's uh. But I, I don't give them a blank check just because they are what we would call proto Pentecostals. I don't really uh buy the whole restoration model thing because just because I can't track the true church doesn't mean it's not there. Uh, I think the whole like oh you know like oh the the true church went dormant. I don't think that's biblical. Uh, I think God has been poured out of spirit and these things have been happening off the churches. And I guess my, my, my main contention, like I would have with a lot of them at Azusa, cause I, I like, I've read the papers. I've been to Azusa street. I've been to bon the Bonnie Bray house. I've, uh, I've seen Annie simple McPherson's pulpit, all of that. Did and I do, guess my, my main thing is, <laughs> Oh, it's like, uh, yeah. Like the, like what the, I guess my whole issue with them, what does the scripture say? And just like I would disagree with William Seymour on the three steps uh, theology, I think that's wrong. I think he was sincere, but he was wrong. Uh, I guess my whole thing is like to say they suddenly stop. I guess where is the scriptural evidence for that? That that would be uh, right. kind well, of more I mean, of my issue. I mean, where's the scriptural evidence that they continue? So that's the that's the that's the flip side of that argument, right? So then we just we call that argument a wash, and we just lay that argument down because it's not a good argument on either side, yeah, right? And sure. so what continu what continuationists want to continually do is show me in the scripture where the signs and wonders will stop, and I then say, show me in the scripture where the signs and wonders will continue, and it's like, okay, well we're in a Mexican standoff. Well, let's well, go to the next argument. I can, I can show you what they began, though. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on. Let me, uh, let me, <laughs> why am I doing this? Let me take Brandon's side for a second. It, it's not, it can't be truly a wash because if it says this is happening, right? So the, def the, the default position now is the, these things are going on. These things are a thing. So it, it is moving. And then to say, where did it stop? 
what you say, well, because of this and this and this, um, we see that it, it seems like it stopped. But then when Brandon, you say, well, show me where it continues. Well, he doesn't have the same burden to show where it continues because the default position is it's moving forward. It is happening. So just to be accurate, um, which sounds like I'm – anyways, to be accurate, it's not exactly a wash um, because you would need to show where it actually stopped, where Brandon would say, well, look, here's where it started, and it doesn't say it stopped. So, I mean, the default position is it's still moving forward. Right, and that's just been the be default charismatic position for 100 years. But, you know, the, the burden of proof is not on me to show that it stopped. History shows that it stopped. But that's the thing. Anything. When you we, even look at church history, like even many of the uh, – like the church, like uh, records of certain uh, church leaders, like uh, there was no idea that the gifts, even Tertullian, which I'm, which me and him have had some disagreements. Uh, <laughs> even he talked about the, the uh, prophetical gifts being with us, and he used that uh, as a proof. Apparently, Praxis wasn't that crazy about uh, charismata, but he even attested to it uh, in that age. And I mean, not that you want to take an early pope's word, but I mean. This idea as we have it now that it just ceased in this like cold turkey form is, uh, I would say it's church history. It, 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 from what I've read, it seems to be pretty. No, well, yeah, I mean, also, I, Chris, well, I, hang on. I, I, I'm just having a problem here because, you know, you're saying like from history, we say it stopped. Well, from history, you can say that, you know, it didn't it didn't seem like it continued to happen. But is that did it stop because God's like, all right, it is stopped now because I God say so or because it just, you know, people just stopped doing it. No, so because like, the death of you, the apostles, you, like people are not walking around with the gift the same as the apostles that have the gift of healing where they're regrowing two legs on somebody where they're walking up and they're raising people from the dead casually as Paul does. Like that's but, just nonsense. No one's but, doing that. The apostles and no one's do. and no one's saying that. We've shifted the goalposts, though. Like no one's talking about like you know at will healing. Like we're, we're if you want to say that's exactly the same as you know God sending a, vi a vision or a dream to somebody, then yes. I guess you can make that. Okay, but I don't I, think everyone the, in this discussion is saying that. I hate Bethel too, Chris. I just want want you to know that. So uh, you what now? No, Bethel. I, said, I, I hate Bethel too. I just want to put that on the table. So, I mean. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I know. And I'm not saying, look, I am not saying that God's gifts ceased. That is not the cessationist argument. People continue to conflate this. What the, the, what, the, what the argument is, is not that God still does not give gifts of healing to the church. He does not give gifts of tongues to the church. He does not give all of these different gifts that are all just through scripture. We're not saying that those things cease. We are saying that things like direct revelation to write scripture has ceased. We are well, saying and no one's arguing like, that. I know. Like, does anyone here argue that? No, no I, I'm with yeah, Chris 110. So yeah, if somebody's saying like, that, they're false prophet. Yeah, it, it, it seems like Chris keeps coming back to that, but then when someone presents something that's underneath that bar, he seems to still be pushing back against it. To some well, the thing is, the thing is like. Uh, there is a there is a problem here. It's like whenever Kevin, um, as he Kevin took off, uh, but it's like you know whenever Kevin I think was the main proponent, which I don't disagree with. But but there is a thing here. So help me figure out the, this thing. So it is somewhere between people believing that God, uh, somewhere between a funny taco or something subconsciously is just kind of vaguely pulling on your conscience in the middle of a dream, and you're like, oh, I can pull some meaning from that. Very undivine, very un unspiritual, just. Meaning from a dream. Wonderful. I think everyone can say, sure, that's great. Um, and then there's the other side, which Chris is like coming in heavy about, about, you know, God doesn't give you dreams and visions or prophecies to the level that would require someone to write another gospel and add it to canon. And then all of us are saying, sure, sure, sure. Um, but there's some middle ground where someone is saying, you can have a dream divinely imparted from God that's, you know, for you or that tells Bubby to reach out, you know, he's gotten a car wreck or something and needs flowers you can have some divine communication from god that is from god but it is also not to the level that would be scripture and it sounds like chris is saying anything that would be divinely inspired from god must be scripture while the other side is saying no you can have a divine revelation right. from god that is not scripture that's right the, that's, that's the, the huge problem god does not whisper we can go right back to that that is the huge problem, is people claiming divine revelation outside of the Scripture attacks the sufficiency of Scripture and rejects the God of the Bible. 
That then what is would you, the problem. Well, have, but then what would you, oh, well, hang, hang on, wait, wait. Uh, but then, Chris, what would you say if it's not in it, which you may say is intact, but if it's something like, you know, completely unrelated to Scripture? Like, you know, we have a Bible that tells us what we generally need to know, but if it's something specific, like, Chris, I, I don't know, something to do with, with you, right, that only, only God would know. So it would be attacking or countering Scripture. It's got nothing to do with Scripture. It's just a very, you know, interpersonal thing. Would you say no? That's still technically somehow no. That's still scripture? a satanic attack on scripture. Okay, so be- because why? Can you walk us I through disagree. this? Because this is going to keep happening. Because the Bible says that it is sufficient for all things for life and godliness, right? So Second Timothy three sixteen and seventeen is extremely clear on the role of scripture. And when we try to say that we need something beyond Scripture in order to successfully live the Christian life, we are now no attacking the God of the Bible. Well, but no, no, one's right there. no one that. Well, hang, 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 hang on, hang on. Yeah, I want serendipity to go after me. Like, I really want to like flesh this out. Like, as if we haven't done this again, we're going to keep going back to it. But you know, when you just said for for life and all godliness, if, if I get uh, all analogies break down, so bear with me. Imagine a very holy type analogy. But Chris, like you said, you had a rough day yesterday. I don't know. Consider you're about to run for the Razors. Um, I know all the stuff for godliness and to help you live a godly life, but I don't know your circumstance. So maybe you had a rough day and you're like, oh, I can't take it. I'm going to end it all. And then I don't know. Someone would say, you know, God whispered to me or God gave me a dream that, you know, Chris was going to like, you know, put himself on railroad tracks. And uh, then I'm like, hey, Chris, I just wanted to check up on you. How are you doing, man? I had a vision or I had a dream or God whispered in my ear or whatever. God, God told me. Or I felt con- compelled to say, uh, Chris, I-, I had this thought that maybe you were on a railroad track and, you know, you had a rough day. And you're like, oh, my goodness, blah, blah, blah. That has nothing to do with a godly life. That has nothing to do with what you just said. Scripture said life and godliness. That's like a completely other category. That's just like, hey, Chris had a crappy day. God let him know it. So, you know, I talked him off the ledge. Like, of course, the Bible has everything you need to live a godly life. But this is a very different category. Do you not see that at all? Uh, and then serendipity. Yeah, no, I don't see that at all. God does okay, not whisper, so that's it. God said, yeah, I this woman is my wife. I, I can tell you, the I, I've had, it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't by virtue of, of a dream or a quote-unquote physical whisper, but I don't know if you've ever had anything in your life where you've experienced um, divine presence, but... I can tell you that the morning that I found my husband, there was absolutely unequivocally no doubt in my mind. It's not anything I could ever make anybody else believe. But that morning, seconds before I opened that bathroom door and found my husband, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that the Holy Spirit did not completely wrap me up in his arms and let me know that it was going to be okay, that I was going to be okay. Um, before I knew what was on the other side of that door, somehow I knew. I mean, and this is literally just seconds. It's just seconds. But I knew. I, I knew what, I knew my husband was dead on the other side of that door. Just randomly, This the, he wasn't sick. This wasn't expected. But like, you know, you go to bed one Saturday night and everything is fine and you wake up one Sunday morning and your world is turned upside down. And I can tell you unequivocally that in, in those those seconds before, he wrapped his arms around me and I knew and I knew that it was going to be okay. I knew that I was going to make it and I don't have an explanation for that, but there's absolutely no doubt in my mind that it was not of the devil. It was 100% divinely inspired. Right. And that's not what we're saying. We're saying. And he carried me. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I, I would say that's 100% the Holy Spirit, Tippity. Like, I mean, that's not, that's not in question, right? Like the, the Holy Spirit is our comforter. Like he, he gives us his power to be able to, you know, deal with, um, you know, the world um, and the flesh and the devil. And so, you know, I would say that that is 100% the job of the Holy Spirit. I think that, you know, something like that and that tragedy, God uses those things to deepen our relationship with him, even through the tragedy. And I think that that's, and that's absolutely indicative of how the current work of the Holy Spirit works in every believer's life. 
no one would say any different. I'm about to well, go on all this, but I just, I just like wanted to throw this up there. Can I ask the room the question? <laughs> hey, before I go to the office, can I just say this real quick? I was going to say, now it's funny because, you know, like, you know, of course, me and Chris, we've had these respectful dialogues, but I, I am I am a strong continuationist with a shotgun, I should say, because I don't buy everything. But when it comes to, like, I, I call the Holy Ghost matchmaking, I don't believe in that. That's uh, and and again, I'm a continuations, but Wait a I would. What is that? Uh, you know, you like, oh, you're gonna be my wife. No, yeah, and I'm not knocking it huh? that it works out for somebody. I don't believe in that because we don't see that. This is something I've never even heard of. You guys, you can't just like do a drive by with that one. I got to. Oh, you never heard of Holy Ghost away, I, I I can pick it up when you go away. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like King, oh, the we'll Lord showed second, showed this is my wife, my husband. Uh, my wife was prophesied not to marry me. I, it, it, it was just all kind of, and when I remember that happened, it was very traumatic, but I didn't throw away the baby with the bathwater. I said, what, what say of the scripture? And I looked through the scripture because at least I was taught that we are to judge prophecies by the word of God. And I saw where the, the widows were told they could marry whoever they wanted, as long as even the Lord. I said, oh, no revelation. I said, so that prophecy wasn't of God. I waited by the scripture and I could shoot it down. I said, no, nah, but they were trying to, they were trying to tear us apart. But I went, and the more I looked into it, I found that that's not something the Bible says. So just for, you know, showing that answer, but you see some nonsense like that going on. And I preach against that vehement. Uh, yeah, King, we're going to come right to you. But yeah, Chris, if there was any argument that would that would send me running to Chris's side um, against my will, it, it would be that one. Like the whole, like, you know, God told me you're going to be my wife. It's like, what a, that just sounds like such a manipulative, like, oh my gosh. But trying why to is it that side, people... like? Why this like that people just get lying on the Holy Ghost. I, hang on, King. Did, did you not hear me? How I was in the middle of a sentence, or how I said we'd get right to you? Okay, wonderful. So, I mean, you know, buy the lady at dinner first. Like, instead of being like, "God told me you're going to be my wife," it's like, goodness. If if people want to like, you know, make Christianity sound like The Handmaid's Tale, that may be a way to do it. What's up, King? How can we help you today? Why is it that people can lie on the Holy Ghost? When there is a scripture that says in the book of Acts that a person lied to the Holy Ghost and they died. But people lie on the Holy Ghost every day, all day long, and they don't drop dead. Wonderful question. Like what? I don't even know what that means. Like what? how do you lie on the Holy Ghost? They lied to the Holy Listen Ghost. Listen to what he just said. People will prophesize and walk up to you and say, God said, you're going to be my husband. Or Jesus said, you're going to be my husband. The Holy Ghost said, you're going to be uh, my wife or something like that. That has happened to me numerous of times when I was used to be in church. And I was to be like, the Holy Ghost ain't tell you that. Because he didn't, it didn't tell me. And I didn't, I didn't, I, and I can discern. And I was like, oh no, it was many of women that did that, but they lie. Oh. How come, wait a minute. Listen, listen, listen. How no, come I'm, I'm, I'm understanding what you're saying now. I'm, I'm getting it. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You understand what I'm saying? I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna right there. Go ahead. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. No. I mean, I mean, why does God not kill him outright? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> can, I, can, can I ask this question? Um, like, have you guys thought about maybe? Well, well, wait a minute. I don't even think. Yeah. Hang on. The hang first on. question was I, asked. Yeah. I mean. Guys, I think maybe the stage is a little too crowded. If you find yourself unceremonially to be dropped, it's probably because you interrupted someone in the middle of their sentence. Chris, you're in the middle of a sentence. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't know. No, I'm good. I mean, I, I got my point out. It's just, yeah, I understand. And, like, why does God not drop people dead, like, instantly? Like, I don't know, his grace. Sure. LJ. Yeah, let me just... Yeah, I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to interrupt anyone. I was... um. Yeah, I just wanted to mention the logos. Um, this may be being a part of the conversation. Do you guys think that the logos is uh important to be had when in regards to this conversation? Um, you know, in regards to logic and sound reasoning and divine uh, you know, and divine revelation when it comes I me mean, because uh, you know, from my study, you know, seminary, you know, the logos really is that glue um that merges that together, um, where we're making sound decisions that are in alignment with with the word of god so um i guess our proof is is in the, in that righteousness um that we're able to view through the logos well yeah the logos is important i don't think anybody's denying that right but i think that 
the conversation isn't necessarily on divine revelation necessarily too much right now because if it were on divine revelation you'd see chris going a little bit more ballistic than he is now but when it comes to like the original question that king asked at least when it came to the whole why could pe- why can people lie on the holy spirit now but when ananias did it he got killed for it etc well a way that i can put it into perspective is kind of like think think about let, let's say there's like a there's like a teacher in a classroom being run right a lot of kids are doing like super bad things but only one of them gets punished really badly to set an example for the rest of them to be like hey y'all want to keep on doing this this is the example that I'm setting for you to show what happens when you do this, right? Not necessarily that the teacher's going to give the same exact punishment to all those kids, but a little bit of this is what could happen to you if you continue doing that stuff. Um, and I think it could be more metaphorically shown as a way to like sin to death, et cetera, that type of stuff. But at the same time, it's no reason to not believe that uh, Sapphira and Ananias weren't saved because in Acts 4.32, I'm pretty sure it says action. they were told in the context of all the believers. And in Acts 5, you can clearly tell they know of the Holy Spirit, which only a believer would be able to do. So it's not necessarily that that sent them to hell, right? But it was something that killed them. They sinned to death. So I think that's more so the context of that. Right. Well, to me, that still kind of sort of sounds like the logos um, to a degree because, you know, it's, it's still us using, um, using, I guess, sense, you know, using, um, you know, logic and sound and, and reasoning as far as making a sound decision. So it doesn't get you, you know, living, you know, unrighteously, you know, or succumbing to, you know, the tricks of the devil and that kind of a thing, you know, and sometimes I think, you know, as Christians, you know, um, a lot of times people try to would make us to think that, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, anything is possible to a degree of, you know, there isn't a, a righteous way of living. Like, you know, there isn't a, a, a science even to how we're supposed to live. So I heard you talk about like cause and effect, you know, and I have a son and I teach him consequences of his actions, you know, and in a godly sense, in a righteous sense, you know, so, you know, that becomes murky sometimes when you're able to say, well, hey there, you know, well, you can do it this way or that way, you know, because, you know, that's what someone's, someone's personal belief or feeling that can't match up with anything that makes sense, you know, you know, for every, you know, for a group of people or for us, you know, in this world, you know, because even like with mathematics, I mean, Wait, you know, we LJ, all, LJ, you know, one plus, course, you know, if I'm going to build a house and I get a, you know, I'm not going to get a person who doesn't understand the basics of how to build a house like that discipline, you know, and that's logic. Wait, and, uh, LJ, one, one second. Bible, so. you re- could you repeat what you were saying, but like say it in a more concise way? Cause like, I'm not trying to be offensive in any way when I say this, but you said a lot, but I got very little out of what you said. Could you like condense it or like lower it down a little bit to like kind of explain it a little bit more clearly? Cause I didn't follow really that well with what you were saying. Okay. Meaning like, for instance, if someone, you know, someone talked about if someone's going to prophesy to you or say, Hey, well, you know, God told me something and you know, this is going to happen for you. Right. But you know, that when, when you look at the logos, like logic and sound reasoning, it's like, if I'm saying, hey, I need, I need a house. It's like someone used like wife, but I, I'll just say house. And I'm looking to, you know, have a house built, right? So I'm going to go to someone who understands these measurements, who understands, you know, what type of tools and resources, you know, that's going to take to build this house, especially if I know what type of house or whatever it is that I'm trying to achieve. So I'm going to then match or align myself with something that makes sense for this, which I'm trying to achieve. Right. So when it comes to like, I know we're talking about like divine revelation where that kind of goes outside of that. But I don't necessarily see where it goes outside of that, per se, because at the end of the day, logic, that that logos in the Bible is talking about making sense out of things. You know, it's not about, you know, God commands us to make sense out of things, not to be, you know, a, 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 a you know, a, a, a tool or, a, or someone that could just be manipulated just because of our faith or our belief, you know, God gives us the tools to see righteous and unrighteousness, you know, so we're able to make sound decisions. So the logos in itself, John 1, 1, you know, in the beginning was the word. And when you look at that, they're saying that in the beginning, you know, God also gave us some sense, you know, so when Uh, God gave us the Bible, okay. Not what John was saying. Yeah, sorry, I have we got, a we, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll just, a I'll be done with this, please. You, you told, no, I didn't 
you know, about cutting people off. I'm just going to say this. God gave us the word, gave us gave us those instructions through the Bible, and God gave also gave us sense. And I'll just leave it there. Yeah, I think Bubby and I have the same question, and it wasn't interrupted just to clarify, much like Bubby did earlier because he said a lot, but we got not a lot. But you keep saying logos. Like, do you think the logos means anything other than Jesus in John 1, 1 when it says in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God? You talk about like logos, like it's it's like logic and reasoning and common sense. Like, do you think logos means anything other than Jesus himself? No, I think I think Jesus was the was the example and was the was the embodiment of that uh, uh, of that logic and sound reasoning, think, right? But at okay, the same no. time, like as Christians, right? When when I was taught, when we, we're told we're Christians. That means we live Christ like. So when my thought process in, in the logos is if I'm living like Christ, that means I'm using logic and sound reason. And when I went to seminary myself, the Greek word, the, the, the Greek, the word is translated. It, the original word is logos. you right. And that's where we get the word logic from. So Christ is the most logical and reasonable thing I've ever seen in my life. So, so absolutely. Think, OK, so I, I think we I mean, I wouldn't say logic is not, or, you know, Christ is not logical and reasonable, but I would say, you know, it stops way short. Like, you know, I like can without like, you know, Greek scholarship, like in Revelation, it says, and his name is called the word of God. So, you know, whenever we're talking about the logos and like Christ and, and John one and one, like for people that say, well, you know, the word is actually this or it's that or the logos is this like the logos is Jesus. Like in Revelation, what, 19, it says, and his name is called the word of God. Like, it, it, I mean, logos. Like, so how do you reconcile that from your seminary studies? Like when it says Jesus is this. Okay. All right. So are you saying that when you say that, that Jesus, when you say Jesus is the logos, right? If you're saying Jesus is the, is the logos and we're supposed to live our lives like Christ, right? So are you saying that the, 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 the definition of logos, is that what you're saying that logic and sound reasoning doesn't, is, shouldn't, shouldn't be attributed to Christ? Is that what you're saying? No, I'm just saying you certainly shouldn't stop there. Like it's saying he he, he doesn't just use logic or reason. Like if that's what you're saying, I mean, we no, can say, you I'm know, not, nothing was well, well, the Bible. I mean, the Bible goes on. Oh, the interrupting thing. OK, uh, the Bible talks about. And by the way, I don't want to completely stifle conversation like some some amount of like, you know, interruption is, is not terrible. It's just when it's constant. So, I mean, you know, people I understand people want to like make their points and stuff. So, you know, don't be like super scared to interrupt someone. But, you know, just, you know, give and take. Right. Be reasonable. Um. But no, when, whenever I forgot what I was going to say now, <laughs> um, yeah, Bob, so I three? think Bob's wanted to get in. Hey, well, hang on. Remind me of what we were saying before the interruption conversation. Yeah. I lost my train of thought. So basically what I wanted to hop in with is if that's the meaning of John 1-1, because I, I just feel like you're trying to go too far with this logos thing and trying to bring it to a deeper meaning that's just not there. Um, like when we go to John 1-1, it's not saying – in the beginning was logic and reasoning and the logic and reasoning was with God and the logic and reasoning was God. That's not what it's saying at all. Right? Like, yes, logic and reasoning is perfect with God. Nobody's questioning that. Nobody disagrees with that. But for you to try to extrapolate logic and reasoning out of logos, which we understand is part of the definition of logos. Right. But if you're trying to get logic and reasoning and apply that in logos, I guess, anachronistically to every single thing and application of logos that you see well that's going to be a giant theological issue in some places later and it's also going to be an issue of what are we actually interpreting from the bible and what are we just reading into there to make ourselves sound a little bit deeper in knowledge like it's right. okay for things to be simple right right yeah see I, I was i'm not saying that at all i'm not saying that the logos is christ in its entirety i'm not saying that whatsoever what I'm saying is, and that's the problem. That the logos is, what what I'm saying, saying that. Is, is that the logos it should be a tool. Like when having discussions like this, when we're trying to make sense out of things, well, right? Well, I see. I see. Uh, can I please? I just want to finish, right? I see the logos as being a tool for us to make sense out of things because I don't feel as if in our faith that is meant for us to have all these different opinions and ideas without the Holy Spirit being able to give us all a revelation that aligns all of our thoughts that go that come right back to the will of God. So that's what I'm saying. So logic and sound reasoning is still dealing with the, the will of God, right? So we know that through when things make sense. So that's all that I'm saying. Certain things make, uh, Nate just said something, things have to be in reason. They have to make sense. Like killing babies is not reasonable. Like none of us really have to think about that. That's, 
innate. So that's what I'm saying, that there are certain things that are innate when it comes to it's just righteous, you know, and that's just the way we're supposed to live. And we and we know that And our commandments and the destruction of things that are in the Bible confirm those things that we do feel within ourselves. And the logic and the reason part is just a tool, you know, uh, uh, of being able to decipher what's righteous and what isn't righteous. That's all that I'm saying. But where are you getting that in John one though? I get that. I get that when I when I look at the other scriptures, when I look at other commandments of Jesus Christ that match up with using logic and sound mm-hmm. reasoning, Jesus Christ commands us to use sense. He commands the apostles to do things reasonably, all the time. Like Christ, the life of Christ, constantly he's talking and speaking against people living unrighteously. He's bringing things that make sense. He's bringing actual answers that's logic and sound reasoning uh, yeah, yeah i think i, I think everybody like would uh, would agree with that i think this where people are having issues with you is like uh, when you say that the logos in john one is indicating something other than the person of christ taking on flesh it usually indicates to christians that they have a bad christology or like a bad trinitarian theology which is why everybody's like red lights are on right now they're coming at you. Yeah, well, we can leave the red lights there because there are some other people that haven't spoke yet, so I'd like to get to them. But yeah, to to, leave, to to put a pin in this real quick, yeah, the claim of I think everyone but you, maybe you, maybe maybe eventually you, but everyone else is definitely that, you know, in John 1, this is clearly talking about in Jesus. And, you know, it goes in Revelation as far as to say his name is called the word of God. So uh, for people that are confused about, you know, what does the word mean? Is it a thought in the mind of God? Is it, I don't know, logic or reasoning or whatever? Like the claim of we believe the Bible is this is Jesus. Like all things are sustained through him. Not anything was made that hasn't been made through him. Like he upholds it all. So if part of what he upholds is logic and reason, sure. But it certainly doesn't stop there. Like logic and reason is one small piece of this universe. Um, Jesus is ultimately the word of God. Uh, but real quick, uh, let's see. There are some other people that hadn't spoke yet. I'd like to bring them in. Uh, Yvette, I think you're the mm. next in line that hasn't spoke. Would you like to say anything? No, I mean, I saw Abba and about, uh, I was going to ask him about the sacrifice. Remember yesterday, I you, you said that I should ask Abba, uh, even though I, we have, I have a general view, uh, but uh, he left the room. Oh. So there goes my question. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. so I have no questions. Well, let me know if you see him tiptoe back in. Uh, Aviana, what's up? Did you have anything on yeah, your mind today? Um, I just wanted to say that I'm going to be posting a link. So um, if any of my continuationist brothers and sisters um, would like to check it out, it's a lecture series um, on cessationism. Um, that can maybe help you guys better understand our position um, and maybe help you to think of things that you might not have thought of already. So I'm going to go ahead and just post that now. Uh, what's up, Patrick? Hey. Um, so I was listening, and uh, oh, wait, good morning, everyone. Um, good morning. So I guess my question is, is that... Um, is that is the idea that that um let's say and, and here's my example let's say uh i haven't spoken to pick somebody i haven't spoken to look up in some quite some time and somehow or another i have a dream about him and i don't really know what it means i don't claim that it really means anything but the way it left me feeling was kind of off so I call up, look up, and I just say, hey, man, this might sound crazy, but this is what I dreamt about you, and uh, I don't know what it means. It might not mean anything. Don't think I'm crazy, but this is what I, this is what I saw in the dream. This is what you were doing. And then somehow he tells me, oh, man. So, and then he starts spilling to me stuff, that, something that's been going on in his life, which kind of coincides with the dream. Not kind of, it does coincide. Are we saying that God doesn't do that? And like, so from from now the word of God, I could tell him, hey, where you're going is wrong. What you've been doing is wrong. Here's, and here's why, and go from the word of God. Not necessarily talking about dreams, but just, hey, 
you're you're you're, go, you're heading down the wrong path, and you shouldn't do that. Yeah. So, but I don't. I think I don't understand why we can't get that anywhere else other than just scripture. Doesn't scripture just lay that out already for us? Like, it's well, no, not, about that has already revealed it. Well, his premise was the his premise was the specific, like because like scripture isn't going to tell us go talk to Lou right now. He's dealing with some stuff on a personal level. Like the Bible's not going to say anything specific. So like when, once you identify, like if what well no hold on like uh, hang on y- you're for example if I open the book the entire Bible it's not going to say Christopher is dealing with some stuff on a personal level go talk to Chris like the words just are not in there right so that that's what I'm saying so is to Patrick's to, to yeah, it is generalized, right? But if you don't know where to point it, it's like if there's, you know, Chris, Steph, CEO, Bubs, and everyone's on a, a mountain peak except for Chris, it's like, hey, Steph, here's some general advice. And she's like, okay, yeah, great. I know that. It's in the Bible. CEO, same thing. Bubs, same thing. And then finally I get to Chris, maybe or may not. I may run out of people. Um, then I'll be like, hey, Chris, you know, here's some good advice. You're like, you're right. The Bible is profitable for all inspiration and understanding. It is sufficient for a godly living. But if I'm talking to like 30 other people who I don't know need this stuff, and then there's Chris versus, you know, feeling a certain way, which Patrick, first of all, I would say I'm fine with what you said, Patrick. And I think the, the closest you'll get to Chris and Bubs being fine with what you just said is to say it that way, which is you wake up, you feel a certain kind of way without saying God told you at all. You go to a person, you're like, hey, I have no idea what's happening, but are you having a rough patch in your life? And then they're like, yes. And without any explanation on how you possibly think that came to be, you just give them some Bible stuff. I think that's as close as you're going to get to Chris accepting it um, without trying to say God told you, like attribute it to tacos or something. Um, So I, I think, is that right, Chris? Like if he feels a certain way for any reason and he's like, I don't know why this is happening, but could you use some godly advice? And then they're like, oh, that's exactly what I needed. You may be like, did God tell you that? Be like, I can't say that. But here you go. (laughs) Humans, yeah, humans have pattern-seeking behavior. This is one of the things that we do as humans extremely well, is that we try to find patterns in everything. And what we're doing is ad hoc putting a pattern back and attributing a pattern that we sought and see in the situation to the Holy Spirit as divine revelation. That's all we're doing. And so what I would say is God does not act that way. God does not give us vague impressions or does he does not whisper to us in order to instantiate his will. His will is given perfectly clear for every situation for our lives in every way in the scripture. Period. End of story. I, well, I, I have I um I, I have a I have a personal story. So February two thousand eight, my, my dad was in the hospital for two months and I, I hadn't seen my uh, the girl I was dating in, in a while. So I quickly went to Columbus, Ohio to to visit her. And the second day I was there, she she had had a dream and she said, You have to go home right now. I had this dream, something's gonna happen with your father. You have to go home right now. And I did, and my father passed away the next day. If it wasn't for her dream, how she interpreted it, and what she told me, my father would would have died without me being there. So it's difficult for me to accept that as completely random. Yeah, and that's understandable. Um, It's difficult to to understand some events as completely random for them happening, right? But again, at the same time, I've heard so many atheists make the same exact claims about what's going on except they just replaced the word holy spirit with i just had this gut feeling i just had an instinct and then they'll use those two instead of holy spirit to say hey i had a dream that this bad thing was gonna happen to you uh don't go there there's literally a whole movie based off it. it's literally final destination that was based off this entire premise right like this entire thing i don't believe like we, I feel like we're over-spiritualizing things that don't need to be spiritualized. Like, yes, it's great to try to see God in everything, but it's not great to shove God into everything. Right, but... And it seems like we're lo- looking back in hindsight and being like, hmm, I don't understand why, therefore God. It's literally committing the God of the gaps on ironic. Well, wait, 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 Hang on, it, it can't be doing that. Yeah, because it's what he's saying. Like, you know, it's not, you're not ad hoc looking back. Like, you, under these people's premise, the things they're saying, like, it's they get something and they move forward. They're not like pronouncing judgment looking back. 
like this is oh i think this and then they proactively go do something and then because like it's forward moving in a linear no pattern, no i so understand but, I, but then to that point but, but, the but, but then, do the same thing but right okay so first of all does that mean like god i don't know i mean you may say yes but you know I mean, there's also been books written about that right like how they got this intuition and later they attribute it to god which may be exactly what you're talking about but then they became christians so does that mean just because we say something is exactly like you say it was like shoving god into everything i mean maybe people are certainly doing that but yeah, does but that mean every but does that mean every single case it cannot be every single case like that that would be incredible so just like every atheist that has like final destination intuition um which i would challenge that a little bit i think final destination was they didn't know they shouldn't have done it and they like, died for it anyways but um does that mean every atheist who has this gut feeling that's not that could not be God like kind of nudging them a certain direction? I don't know. That's inevitably going to lead to their well, salvation. Well, who knows? Well, no, because well, they're atheists. They don't have the Holy Spirit, exactly. so it wouldn't be the Holy Spirit guiding them. It, so no, exactly. it wouldn't be God. It, it, exactly. I, I I would agree with that. And, and just picking off, I wouldn't say Chris I wouldn't said, say guiding. I would say that drawing. Right. That how everyone eventually comes to God. Right. No one comes see, to God. But, God see, no, I I understand that. But that drawing is completely different than the feeling of having it. Right. That's completely different in this in that sense. And what they're speaking of is having it and having it work with them. Right. That's a completely different thing than the Holy Spirit just drawing someone. And my argument is hinged on the fact that if atheists can make the same claim in a godless sense, in a completely secular sense, then I feel like we're completely over spiritualizing this. 90% of the time. Well, well I understand it, but just because they, but ju and... ah, hang, hang on. Just, just because atheists do something doesn't make it wrong for everyone else. And just because some Christians over spiritualize and shove God into everything doesn't mean that there aren't legitimate times where that is the right call to make. So just because people overuse and abuse it doesn't mean it's 100% wrong because of that. Do, do, do you know what, though? Um, th this information, like. <laughs> God isn't the only source of information, you know, like, what was it? There was a, in Acts, the woman was demon possessed and she was, you know what I mean? She, she was telling people stuff. And so this idea that, oh, because this dream has happened, uh, and by the way, I've experienced those type of dreams when, I, when you, you dream of somebody and something's going on. And at first I thought nothing of it. And then something made me pay more attention. So I made it my point. If I dreamt of somebody, I'll call them you know have a catch up see what's going on um can i say this was god speaking to me no i can't because scripture doesn't doesn't affirm that can i say it wasn't god i can't so i have to just leave that for what it is the the, the main point is if this um is not used as an opportunity to share the gospel then what are we even talking about do you know what i mean like that's the thing that i find interesting in this people are, uh, people have made it about um you know people People having experiences, people gaining stuff, people, you know, like, but is the gospel preached? Because one thing we do see in scripture is when the Holy Spirit moves in a way like that, the gospel is preached and, and you know, people, I, I you know, people come to repentance. Exactly. So this, this, this statement is, of, is it God? Isn't it God? Nobody could really say either way. But Brilliant. if you've at least shared the gospel with somebody, if somebody has come to, to that truth, you know that that's the that's the best outcome darren i wanted to agree with you totally it's about the spreading of the gospel i gave that example primarily because this is something that happened to me just recently and when i say recently within the last couple of months somebody who i have not spoken to this was a, a whole uh an old high school chum of mine friend of mine Hadn't spoken to her in over two to three years. No contact whatsoever. Nothing. And this dream was so vivid. And I'm not a dreamer. I'm not that guy. I'm very conservative. I'm not the guy that goes chasing after this. I'm not that guy. And I'll, I will steer people away from that. But this dream was so vivid. I woke up in a shake. My wife was like, what's wrong with you? And I was like, I, this is, I, and I told her what the dream was. And she said, well, you, it, you may need to contact this person. I said, she might think I'm crazy. And she's like, he's like, well, no, you, you can't have a dream like that and not contact this person. So I went on Facebook. I went on Instagram. I went, I thought I had a number and I just reached out to different people. I said, Hey, I need to talk to this person. And so 
I got to the point, the person said, oh, I'll hit you back up. And I said, God, you know what? I did my best. I, I'm leaving it as that. And, and I kept feeling the nudge. I said, God, if you really want me to speak to this person, you're going to have to make them call me back because I can't chase after a person and tell them this, this dream because it's, it's, it was, I mean, it was insane. And so finally the person called me back. She said, Patrick, you know why I called you back? It's because you reached out to me several different ways. So I thought, I know it has to be important. And simply what I said to her was exactly what I said in the example. I said, I don't normally do this. I don't know what this is going to mean to you. But I'm just going to tell you, and you you could tell me what this means. I told her the dream in the entirety. She paused for a bit, and she spilled the beans about everything. And, of course, I could point to different things in the dream, like mostly everything in the dream that she was that was happening. But she told me about some sin that she was about to get involved in that was going to be horrific, very horrific stuff. Um, and so I just then I went to the word of God and said, hey, you know, you shouldn't do this and gave her the scriptures. Now, she knows that she knows um, the Bible and all, but. I was able to point her, don't do this. What you think you're about to do that's going to help you is going to is going to cause you a bigger problem down the line. And of course, I don't know what she did in the end, but she she was thankful and she let me know you there's no way I could have possibly known this. And this was some this is personal stuff and I don't know her to that level. So I'm not going to be the one to say that God cannot do this. I'm not going to be the one to say go around and say that, you know, I, I, I've said what I've said, but I just yeah. want. Well, yeah, hang on, uh, Patrick, yeah. Uh, wait, hang on. No, I think we're done with this. We've made a mountain for an hour and a half out of a, a molehill, so I, I honestly have a headache. We need a new topic. Patrick, I agree with what you said. I think that was measured and great. So you're not like, you're not like this is a command from Lord God on high, thus saith the Lord. You're like, look, I don't, don't want to do this. This is what I think. I would be probably doing a disservice to myself and maybe sinning uh you know if i think this is a good thing to do and i don't do it i'm, I'm not doing what i know to do so that would perhaps even be sin for you so i would say no matter how we arrive at this conclusion you were weight you were measured you were uh, you know you said what you said i would agree with that without saying you know this is 100 percent from god or it's 100 percent not or it can't be because of the scripture you did what you did you lived your life i totally agree with that um, so no matter what else becomes of it, I think um, that's probably about the best way that could be presented. So, uh, yeah, we need a new topic. We have been talking about can God give someone a dream or not for an hour and 33 minutes, and I want to drown kittens. Metaphorically, don't actually do that. Steph, are you speaking? Do you have anything that could pull us away to a different topic? Do, do, do you mind if I have a, a quick last comment on that? Now? Probably, but go ahead. Yeah, it, it's just when we say can God do this, my question comes to what is the this? Because if God is giving a dream, then th there's a specific reason for that. And in scripture, you know, it's usually to do with, with his salvific plan. So if the outcome isn't, you know, one of uh, glorif glorification of God in the gospel, then it, I mean, scripture doesn't really show that that's from God. It, it's void. It doesn't do anything. Um, but yeah, I you know I I've I've already just come, so I'll, I'll yield to um to a new topic. Uh, thank you very much. Let me just send out some invites, please. If anyone wants to uh, say anything about anything, jump on up here. Is there anything going on in chat? Um, I'm trying. If we keep this conversation up, it's not my fault. Hey, Bianca, <laughs> anything else? Oh boy. The, the topic that I've been liking will also give you a headache, Nathan. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? <laughs> I've been liking to discuss um, establishmentarianism. Um, I don't know if I would really define it as Christian nationalism, but um, some people would. How would you define Christian nationalism, and then how would you define that? Um, well, I think people have a misunderstanding of what 
some people, I shouldn't say, some people have a misunderstanding of what Christian nationalism is, um, I believe. So being an establishmentarian, I believe that um, there should be only Christians in office and that we should be ruled by the first and second table of God's, of God's law, moral law. Um, but how that's executed, I think, is where it gets tricky and where people fall into, I don't know, some weird things. Who would like to speak to that? Uh, I, so, no, with, with all due respect, I think it's a terrible idea. Any form of theocracy is a terrible idea. Um, theocracy can only work if God is the one actually running the state. Uh, because he's the only one that's actually going to be a perfect moral arbiter when it comes to those things. Uh, your next questions when it comes to specifically a Christian one is going to end up being, okay, well, who's going to be in power? The Orthodox, the Catholics, or the Protestants? All right, what happens when you have ecumenist politicians? What happens when a politician goes into heresy? What do we do with their office? What happens with other religions and necessarily how to move every single person out? Or are we just going to become a fascistic regime and jail them for not being Christian, right? It's just the, the aspects to actually make it work is just too much of a cost for such a flawed product that comes at the end of it. But that's just my personal opinion. Yeah, so I think... Um, oh, sorry. So as much I, as I hate to agree with Bubby, I think that is a decently fair point. <laughs> but I think the first thing that needs to happen, right, is that we we need to be we need to be united, right? The church needs to be united under a common confession. Um, that's the first thing. Like, I don't think this is going to happen for like a very, 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 very long time. Um, but we need to be united. So under, can we use my confession? Huh? Can we use my confession? Can we use your confession? Yes. Let me say you're gonna, totally heretical. Say, huh? Yes, my confession that's heretical. Yeah, no. Um, so the church needs to be under a common, um, right, a common confession. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would say, like, so you were saying how you're going to execute that. So I think historically it was done right. Like if somebody was practicing idolatry, Mm -hmm. um, they would first be given the chance to repent if they if they did not repent then they would be sent to exile so basically another nation that wasn't covenanted to christ mm -hmm. um and then if they refuse to leave um they would either be put in jail or be put to death yeah okay so we, it would operate as a fascistic regime so then ne the next thing that ends up happening is but why do you say why do you say that? Like why? Uh, the reason, yeah, the reason I say it would have to be a fascistic regime is for the government to have any form of power, at least in the U.S., to be able to jail people or execute people based off religious practice. It would have to be a fascistic dictatorship because our constitution fundamentally runs against that. And to change the minds and to move uh, well, like a, a good fifty percent of our country out, and then to weed out the quote unquote true Christians and false Christians, because that's also going to be a big problem in a Christian nationalist society. Who gets to determine who the true Christians are? And then that moment that happens, if you're saying, oh, we're united under one common confession, well, the Baptists and the Presbys aren't going to be under one confession, and that's definitely sure. Well, the Catholics and the Protestants aren't going to be under one confession. Neither are the Orthodox and the Catholics going to be under one confession. So none of the Christians will ever be under that one confession. So that's not going to happen. And if that doesn't happen, which would be a core to that Christian nationalist society, then you can't have the Christian nationalist society, and you're just running into a situation where you just want a theological dictator and you're turning the U.S. into the Middle East. Well, I mean, to be fair, um, I mean, Aviana, <laughs> kind of a case in point, um, for the last, you know, hour and 40 minutes of the can God give people dreams, under your, um, under what you, your kind of idea, um, people would have been exiled over this conversation. <laughs> like, like, I did not expect it to get as heated as it did. But uh, yeah, go ahead and respond, Aviana. Um, I think a lot of it, not all of it though, because I think there's people that still hold to it that don't have that eschatology, but I think eschatology plays a lot into it. I do believe that we're going to be united under one common confession. I'm a post-millennialist. Um, so I do think that's going to, that it's 
going to happen. Um, but that's a whole other can of worms. I feel like I'm not actually ready for that conversation. And I hesitate even to talk about this one deeply because these are things that I'm just starting to like work out. Anyone else? What if that Christian nationalism would kill the conversation? Yeah, I'll just I'll just put it like this. Any type of theocracy or Christian nationalism for Protestants will literally just lead you back to papacy. I'm just going to put it that way. Any type of theocracy leads you back to papacy. It doesn't, though, because they have... Oh, no, 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 no. Oh, no. Um, yeah, you built them. Um, so how so establishmentarianism is a lot different than the way that the Catholics would roll. So the Catholics would say, um, right, the Pope is the ruler. He's the king, right? Um, and he rules over the church, right? And the state. He, he's the king of, of both. So an establishmentarian does not believe that a member, a member of this, I might have this backwards, but I, I'm pretty sure it's the member of the state, a member of the state cannot be right within the church. Um, well, that's a big problem. Like, how are you going to have a Christian nationalist society with Christian politicians that can't be in the church? Hold on. I think it's as leaders. Okay, well, I as can't be as leaders in the church, but if you want the most upright Christian men, because wouldn't you want you the leaders get... of the church? I can't hear you. What? Oh, I said if you wanted the best candidates that were the best theologically read and the most quote-unquote Christian, et cetera, et cetera, wouldn't you need those people in the leading position to take that role? Oh, Avion, you're going to have to mute when you're not speaking. That baby is very loud. All right, go ahead, bubs. Yeah, so, like, my problem comes to if we're running at running it as a Christian nationalist society and we're electing representatives that are founded in their Christianity, that are good in their Christianity, that have great theology, good doc good doctrinal beliefs, great hermeneutic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Those people are more than often going to be the people in leadership positions at the church. And if that's not there and we're just electing people that can't be in leadership positions at the church, then you're just electing at least in the U.S. at this point, 90% layman Christians to try to run the country based off a skewed understanding of the Bible. Now, when it comes to your society, let's say people had some type of understanding or like basic good doctrinal Sunday school type stuff, like just somebody who could go into one of these rooms and defend their faith quite decently, right? If everybody was like that, which I think is pretty utopian, but if everybody was like that, I still think there would be issues. Why would there be issues? because of man's nature and what happens when that much power goes to one person, especially theologically. I think that it's going to end up happening to where, oh, head of state, well, if the head of state's the one who's going to be determining who's, j who's, who's jailed, who's fined, who's exiled over religious issues, he effectively does become the leader of the church because he essentially decides who he gets to kill or excommunicate at any minute, and that's exactly what I'm saying when any type of Christian theocracy or Christian nationalism will just lead right back to papacy. Uh, but, and Aviana, um, you know, stopping a little bit short of the theocracy part, like without changing the constitution. Um, I, I mean, that, and that's what I would say as far as Christian nationalism, um, in my humble opinion. Yeah. Like let's vote as many like God fearing Christian people as we can into office. Why wouldn't we? I mean, unless they were just awful at policies, but assuming they have a reasonable head on their shoulders and are also Christians, then I think that's great uh, without changing the constitution. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if that's a way to split the difference, but I, I think that, but yeah, I think, um, well, that's my two cents to kind of split the difference. Uh, don't forget your muted Aviana. Yeah. Sorry guys. I'm trying to take care of my kids. My daughter took a big pile of mixed berries and, threw them everywhere the frozen ones so like all the juices are probably standing my floor as we speak so <laughs> give me time to exile her <laughs> just just kidding don't exile your child what the what i come back and there's nobody left did you just clear the stage aviana tell him why that is oh <laughs> uh, we had a uh, aviana and i had a conversation over christian nationalism
Oh, sweet. Bubby, are you a proper Christian nationalist now? That Hell would be no. <laughs> you, hey, you know, you know, I'm the black sheep of the family. I'm the only one that's on the I left know. here. <laughs> this is this is why this is why we get along. Hey, uh, the Bayou Steak on Fire, like real soon. Unless that place closed, did it close? I don't know. But anyway, sure. well, you need to get with me this week, bro. I'll see. I'll see. Because I'm pretty Maybe busy today. next. Um, he's he's been telling me yeah, for like a year. He's like, next time I Sunday. he's like, next time in Tampa, I'm gonna like, call you. We're gonna go have lunch. I'm like, sure, buddy, sure, buddy. He's been saying that for like a year. <laughs> I, I don't even know if I don't even know if he's real. I I have not been in Tampa, and so I will come out there. I actually just was on the phone with a client from Tampa, and I have two Aztecas that I've got to go do networks for out in Tampa in the next month. So it <laughs> seems like I will be out there at some point. <laughs> um. Well, I was about to say I, I I need to go, but uh, Chris or anyone anyone who cares? Let's have a fun day. Does anyone want to stay in mod to keep this going? Or me? Uh, sure. <laughs> me. Yeah, me and Bubby. Yeah, mod me and Bubby. Let's see what kind of dumpster fire we can get. Rid of. <laughs> All right, so Sons of Thunder, you got it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna stick around for like five more minutes just to see what yeah, you, what you guys you, get into. Oh no, I was gonna start the chaos after you left, Nate. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> It, does, it doesn't even matter. Right? Like, after that dream conversation, oh, my gosh. I, I don't even – seriously, an hour and 35 minutes, I think, about dreams. I'm like, oh, just say what you got to say. Like, you know, someone's like, the Lord told me, you know, don't eat an apple. Great. I may think twice that day if I eat an apple. Um, just just say it and go on. I don't know. Okay. But Am I too flippant I'll, about this stuff? I'll, I'll throw out one statement. I don't think this should light a fire, but I'm going to light it anyway. Uh PCUSA will be damned and judged by God at the end of the day. No you don't know anything about that, so no one's gonna disagree with you. Oh wait, is that the is that the who is PCUSA? Pentecostal, uh, the Pentecostal Church of the United States of America. Oh no, Presbyterian Church, not Pentecostal. Church. Church. L listen, wow. the Pentecost. I had I had a lot of conversations with Pentecostals yesterday, and I'm really done with them. So listen, well, I, you, I, had, well, you I had a lot of Pentecostals yesterday, <laughs> and they're still stuck in my head. And the Pres I'm one of them. <laughs> yeah, Nate's one of them. Wait, the, the so the Presbyterian, the one you're talking about, that's the one that did the LGBTQ. That, yeah, that, 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 that's, that's the one with like the women pastors ninety percent of the time. Yeah. There's your problem, right? Like, I've played, like, for my college, we have to go to churches sometimes to play, and the two that I've gone to have both been PCUSA, and I <laughs> and I kid you not, both times, it was always the pastor, that like, the uh, pastor was uh, a man at first, right? And I was like, oh, okay, the change up for PCUSA, look at that. But then, like, five minutes later, his wife came up, and was like, I'm also a pastor. I'm just like, oh. <laughs> Did they offer you drugs in the bathroom? Would hey, be hold surprised. my beer, Bubby. Hold my beer. <laughs> Watch this. <laughs> there's something, I don't know, there's just something inherently about having lady parts which makes the truth very difficult. <laughs> oh! All right, now let's have... Oh, no. You're so lucky Steph isn't here. You're and so follow lucky. Us, follow us now so you can find a new house after this one is banned today. <laughs> this one's banned today. <laughs> Follow my backup account for after I get banned today. <laughs> You'll catch me on Rumble. <laughs> it's hilarious. All the times I've got my channel banned, it's never been because of me. Oh, yeah. It's hilarious. We got The amount of cancellations we've gotten, Nate, has been amazing. The amount of controversies we've gotten him into because of things that happened just in the Ask a Christian room. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, Sean. How you doing, buddy? Oh, wait, since I have mod badges, I can just get rid of this schizo myself. Bye, Walter. Who's Walter? The Walter? No, no, not Walter Mole. This is like a Walter Walter guy. And yeah. He just does weird stuff, and I don't know where he's coming. Maybe but no, he's just mad because I was, I was in the atheist room uh, a couple nights ago, and when I was in the atheist room a couple nights ago, we were literally just laughing at clips about John Lee, right? 
And that was about it. I was just playing clips from John Lee and Darth Dawkins. And we were just laughing about both <laughs> situations and playing those videos. And he was just like, oh, look at a Christian selling out other Christians uh, if in front of atheists. I'm just like, one, I don't consider John Lee a Christian. Two, neither do I consider Darth one. Three, I could care less about doing this. These are funny videos. I'm going to laugh. Christians can say stupid things too. So then I'm laughing with them or whatever, whatever. He's just like, you'd be the type, if you were a Jew in the Holocaust, you'd be the type (laughs) of Jew to sell someone or your Jews out. And I'm just like, if I was a Jew in the Holocaust, I'd probably sell you out, Walter. Yes, I would. And then I just continued with my conversation anyway. Like Walter has been following me around for the past couple days as a little schizo and then just been trying to get on my case about like, oh, look at Bubs, the fake Christian. Oh, look at Bubs. Bro, I'm, I'm just tired of Walter. He just, it, like, it's funny at some points, but, like, it just gets annoying. It's too damn early in the morning for Oh, Lord, forgive me for what I've done. Sorry to give you guys a lot of badges, but too late now. All right, have fun. Please don't get me bad. <laughs> Good to see you, mate. See you guys later. <laughs> see you, Sean. Good Take care. Good to see you. Good to see you.